Yeah. Hello, everybody. So despite this quite boring uh, title of my speech, the Helena's annual update, I will try to uh, present to you what has happened uh, during the past year, meaning from the last FOSDEM to this FOSDEM in our project, hopefully in a way which is not that boring. So for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, I've been involved in the Helena's project for uh, some time already. Um, uh, I've also, I also worked uh, on the Solaris kernel uh, when I was employed at Sun and later in Oracle and now I'm working uh, for Avast. And uh, for, uh, for those of you who don't know or have never heard of uh, what Helenos is, uh, you can check out our past presentations from last years because we were here at FOSDEM 2000. Uh, 12 and 13 and if uh, I were to sum up what Helenos is in uh, just one line I would tell you that it's a multi-server, multi-platform, microkernel based operating system which uh, does not uh, strive to be compatible uh, from six. so I use the non-conformist term here and uh, as I was listening to uh, Normans a normal speech. Uh, he uses this analogy to Lego bricks. Uh, I, I like this analogy. Uh, I wanted to, to also use it in this context uh, to explain what I mean by non-conformist because there are both advantages and disadvantages in being non-conformist. Disadvantages are clear. There are not that many applications that uh, run out of the box. You can't borrow, uh, I don't know, um, things like uh, Firefox and run it in Helenos because these things are simply not compatible. Uh, but there are also uh, advantages that stem from it. Uh, and if, uh, if I use this uh, Lego analogy, it's uh, maybe sometimes you uh, want to use a brick which has a certain size, but uh, the box with the Lego brick doesn't have any like that. So uh, you want to make a brick which exactly fits your purposes. Or uh, sometimes uh, there is uh, a fear that uh, by using uh, one, le one Lego brick from the whole box you will be forced to use all the other bricks that you are otherwise not interested in. So um, by being non-conformist uh, uh, we basically don't have this problem because we tend to write everything uh, from scratch or that's our preferred way of doing stuff. So everything you will see if, if I give any demos, uh, it's, uh, it's written from scratch, uh, there's uh, no third party code in it. And um, I, it's, uh, it's, it's basically this, uh, all our bricks are tailored to our needs. Uh, so uh, the past year, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I will be talking uh, about um, the changes that were incorporated into our uh, main repository, which is called Mainline. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to say that contrary to the previous years, we owe a lot to our students uh, who worked on their thesis and they finished their work and we were able to integrate their work. So much of the stuff that I'm going to mention uh, in relation to our mainline repository is actually a result of some students finishing their thesis. I will be mentioning Helenos Coastline, which is, at least to me, an exciting uh, feature, uh, which, which somehow allows us to bridge the gap between, uh, between the third-party applications that are out there, but uh, are not compatible with our system. So this is bridging the non-conformist gap I will also mention uh, a couple of uh, branches that are out there but uh, that have not yet been integrated into our source tree for various reasons but that deserve uh, attention anyway. Uh, I will briefly mention uh, what were those pieces that were completed. I will try to share uh, with you our experience with uh, the uh, Summer of Code in Space program that uh, we were part of this year. And I will finish with V2 
giving you some info about the Helenos camp that I attended in September of last year. So what are the goodies that are to be found in our mainline and that were in there last year? So uh, when I thought about it, I came to the conclusion that probably the most striking one for me uh, are the networking features. Uh, because um, there is a great change in usability compared to what it was like uh, last year. Because uh, last year there was no IPv6, now we have uh, almost complete IPv6 uh, stack next to the IPv4 stack. Uh, I'm not, now not mentioning the already present features. Uh, and what is especially nice is that uh, uh, now there is some sense of uh, automatic configuration. So when you boot into Helenos, it will automatically uh, run the HCP uh, client uh, and configure its network address. Uh, network name resolution will work. And these are, uh, to you, it may, it probably seems like a completely uh, usual stuff, but it was not like that to us because a year ago, uh, we had to manually configure the networking and we were lucky that there was any uh, networking at all. So this year it just starts up and it's there automatically, so it's a huge change uh, in, uh, in functionality. Um, a little bit uh, of smaller importance is the support for uh, things like the slip serial over IP, or IP over serial actually. Uh, protocol, and even though we uh, still don't have uh, a full-fledged web browser, uh, we at least do have uh, something uh, as the wget uh, utility, which we call download utility. So it is now possible to uh, download um, a file from from the web. Um, as a side note, there is an interesting. Uh, comment about our networking stack because I believe that Helenos is one of the very few uh, operating systems that has a networking stack, a part of which, or a significant part of which, uh, was implemented, implemented during a journey to FOSDEP. So this was actually the case uh, two years ago when uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Yuri Svoboda, we drove in, in my car from Prague uh, to Brussels, I think it's some 700 kilometers, and he spent a great deal of this time just typing and programming uh, RTCP and the um, configuration interface. So there is a special relation uh, between our networking stack and FOSDEM. Uh, GUI improvements. Uh, so um, I think it was already already the case last year uh, when uh, another colleague of mine, Rita, uh, did a demo of our new uh, GUI. But uh, um, it was not part of the release. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to mention in relation to this is that there has not really been that much progress. Uh, at this front, uh, besides some uh, speed optimizations and uh, uh, fixes, for example, uh, there was um, an annoying bug. Um, if uh, an application or a task crashed and this task had an open window, it would not automatically close. So we fixed uh, these annoyances. So now when, when a task with a window crashes, the windows uh, get closed. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, uh, this area was not that uh, not that uh, interesting in, in terms of uh, new features and, uh, and progress. Um, maybe one thing worth of mentioning is that uh, we now uh, have a uh, VNC server, so it is possible um, and thanks to the, the architecture of our um, compositing desktop, it's possible to have uh, several viewports, which, which were originally mentioned uh, to support multiple displays. Uh, so uh, one of these uh, vi uh, viewports can be assigned to the VNC session. So um, 
So it basically it works like a second monitor, or it can work like that. Uh, I will show you later how the, the environment looks now, because it's slightly different than what uh, Norman demoed uh, in his uh, talk. Uh, there is a slight change in, in the look. Okay, but uh, more interesting uh, stuff went into the audio, because there was no audio at all before. So we had another student who worked on the audio stack and uh, wrote a thesis about it. Um, we like this uh, um, metaphor, especially uh, as I spoke before about our uh, compositing uh, desktop. So we like to uh, talk about our uh, sound uh, service as a compositor for sound because well, when you think of it, it uh, basically works on the same uh, on the same ground. So it takes in, uh, sound uh, or audio inputs from applications, applies some transformations uh, on them, merges them, and then just uh, puts it to the uh, output devices. So it's basically doing the same thing as the desktop uh, compositor is doing to, to graphics. So um, this architecture is roughly uh, comparable to the Pulse audio that's known from Linux and maybe also. Uh, now uh, Helenos features SunBlaster 16 driver as the only sound device which is currently supported. Uh, there was an interesting uh, issue with uh, with the development of the audio branch and then later with running and uh, playing any sounds from Helenos because uh, the kernel physical memory allocator was not uh, really fit uh, for the purpose of allocating memory at specific uh, ranges. So if you wanted to have uh, memory allocated uh, meeting uh, certain criteria, like uh, below 60 megabytes, it was not possible. So uh, uh, the entire development of this audio branch happened uh, uh, on a machine which only had 16 megabytes of memory, which was quite limiting uh, to the author, and which was later fixed thanks thanks to uh, Martin, who implemented a completely new kernel physical memory allocator, which is capable of allocating physical memory based on a bit mask constraint or constraints given by a bit mask. Um, okay. Maybe I can give a brief demo that will both show you uh, the new GUI just to appreciate the new look and also play a sound. So hopefully... Uh, everything will work as expected. This is, this, is, this is the new look. It's quite different from what was shown previously. I'm not going uh, into great details about that because a slightly similar version of it was already presented last year. But uh, um, I have a WAV file here which I'm going to play hopefully. So this is uh, the Helenos uh, sound server in action. Okay, um, now something um, more tangible. Uh, so during the past year, uh, we've also seen contributions from people uh, that, uh, that are in some respect external to, to our team, uh, people that just come on the IRC and uh, or the mailing list and say, hey, I've implemented support for Raspberry Pi. So one of these guys uh, uh, is uh, Benjamino Galvani, uh, whom we met yesterday actually at FOSDEN. So it was a nice surprise. And uh, the, other, uh, the other new things uh, on the ARM front uh, is uh, is a support for BeagleBoard XM and BeagleBone um, development boards. 
the beagle bo the beagle board XM support is slightly older because it has already been there in some form before the previous first dam. But I wanted to mention it anyway because uh, even first dam 2013 there was some uh, there were some improvements uh, uh, regarding these boards. Uh, and they were mostly related to uh, enabling caching uh, on these boards, which uh, proved to be quite uh, quite a difficult task, because up until yesterday, uh, I thought that the ARM architecture allowed something like six level of uh, caches. And uh, just uh, tonight, I noticed an, an email from the guy who implemented support for BeagleBoard XM uh, and fixed something, uh, and the commit log was that uh, eight level of caches are possible on ARM. So uh, uh, when it comes to caches on ARM, it's really a hell of caches. Uh, uh, the support for these boards uh, is not uh, really completed because uh, there we are hitting uh, a limitation of the generic Helenos, uh, it's not very good uh, at running only on the serial, uh, over the serial console. It's uh, much better at running with some kind of a frame buffer. So um, they are not that usable because um, usually the farthest you can get uh, with them is to the kernel console and play with the kernel console, uh, which I will not show you right now. <laughs> Maybe later if we have time. Uh, oh, in uh, relation to, uh, to these Beagle board and Beagle bone um, uh, boards, maybe uh, ARMv7 in general, there was an interesting bug that was uh, that was bothering us for some time. It was causing lots of kernel panics and instability, and uh, there was a problem in Helenos. Uh, in uh, initialization of page tables, because uh, when we allocated new page tables, the first thing that we would do was to uh, clear them out, clear the memory, so that uh, there are no random data, there is no random data in that area. But uh, we did not flash the caches, and then uh, the hardware page of Walker just did not consider uh, caches for the purposes of walking the page tables and found the garbage that was not supposed to be there anymore. So uh, Janov is the guy who works on, on this. He finally figured out and fixed it. This was this was a, an interesting bug. Okay, on the Spark front, uh, I revived the support for uh, the Sunfire T1000 server, which is the machine uh, on the left. Uh, I have one in my
thing about this is that it's basically a PC with, uh, with a MIPS CPU on it and uh, PC devices, so you can, you can find uh, uh, you can find the ISA bus on it, uh, the serial port is there, the uh, IDE disks, uh, ECI is, is there. The only thing is that there is no BIOS on it, there is something else uh, called Yamon, yet another monitor, uh, which does play a role because uh, people who are used to the PC architecture are used to, for example, seeing the PCI configuration space fully configured after BIOS passes control. Uh, to the operating system, which is not the case on Malta. Uh, there, uh, you, you get basically the, the machine is completely uninitialized when you get control. Um, uh, there is also another aspect. I wanted, uh, I wanted to buy one, uh, one of these Malta boards, because uh, MIPS is one of uh, the that's the only one uh, processor architecture for which we don't have real hardware. Uh, so I wanted to have something to to run tests on and to, to do the development on. <coughs> so I contacted MAPES and uh, I had the idea that uh, I will buy it at a cost similar to the other development boards which can be like 100 euros or 200. I think 200 was the maximum that I was willing uh, to sacrifice. But they surprised me uh, when they told me that uh, the price starts at some $2,000. And uh, several weeks afterwards, I read the news in newspapers that they went bankrupt and uh, were bought up by someone else. So maybe uh, there was something wrong about their uh, sales strategy. Uh, and it's not even possible to get one, or it's probably very difficult to get one at eBay. I am constantly looking for one, and so far I have not really been successful. <laughs> On the other hand, what is good about it is that this Malta board is supported by uh, uh, by almost any emulator which is out there. So it's supported by Simix, it's supported by Kirimo, supported by GXMO. So that's also the reason why, uh, why we support it in Havanos. Also, the support for this board is not fully finished. There is some, some pending work uh, to be done. But the point I wanted to make in relation to this board is that working on a port to Malta is uh, interesting because it uh, uh, kind of reveals bugs in the ordinary drivers uh, that are not exposed on the i 32 architecture because the PC architecture is quite forgiving. So it will forgive you lots of mistakes um, in the driver programming, which is not the case in Malta. So for example, accessing uh, um, hardware registers using uh, using wrong size. So if the register is 32-bit and you use four one-byte accesses, may be okay on uh, IA32, but if you do something like that on Malta, it's not going to work. So that's why I consider this architecture important. Okay, that was Malta. Um, a completely, a completely different note. Uh, changes in our tool chain and tools. Uh, there is this uh, new script, new Python script that we call U, and I've already demoed it basically. Uh, when I when I uh, ran the demo of the sound server. Uh, I don't know if it's visible. Maybe uh, by seeing this command line, you can guess what's the purpose of it. It's a um, it's basically a script which uh, looks at the configuration of Linux on the way how Linux was configured, and uh, then just spawns uh, an emulator. So this EW stands for an emulator wrapper, and we uh, use it to run. Is the preferred way to run Helenos now? Because previously uh, there were problems with what arguments need to be there uh, for every uh, emulator. We used to have uh, a set of uh, um, simple scripts that uh, were not that flexible for this task. So um, this is a nice solution for running Helenos, and it's automatic. 
configures everything itself. We also updated our um, the, the compiler uh, that we use for building Helenos. So we went from 4.7.2 to uh, 4.8.1. And there we hit an interesting problem uh, because uh, I think it was 4.8.0. Uh, suddenly Helenos stopped working, uh, which is nothing, uh, nothing uh, spectacular when you change the compiler. But the reason uh, in this case was that uh, there is some new optimization in uh, GCC which is uh, uh, able to recognize some patterns in the algorithms. So it uh, correctly recognized our uh, memset and memcopy implementations and optimized them uh, to calls to memcopy and memset. So uh, there was this kind of, uh, infinite recursion. Uh, <laughs> it was funny to fix. Uh, uh, we also uh, we try to be compilable, buildable by Clank. So uh, this support has been broken for some time, and now it's been revived. So if you like Clank, you can build Helenos using Clank. Okay, Coastline. This is the exciting thing, the new thing. Uh, it's a project which originally started as uh, an effort uh, to bring GCC to Helenos, but evolved into something a little bit uh, larger, which is uh, similar to OpenBSD ports or Arch Linux uh, PKG make or make PKG, uh, or the uh, portage from, uh, from Gen2 Linux. Uh, uh, the coastline is, uh, and I hope that you will appreciate the terminology, uh, it is based on uh, the ideas of harbors, which in other uh, systems are usually called ports, and, uh, <laughs> and ships. Uh, basically, uh, for, for each application, for each ship, which, is, which can be GCC or Binotails or Python, uh, there is a harbor file, which is like a recipe for what needs to be done, what changes need to be applied to the sources of these so-called ships uh, in order for them to build uh, for Helenos and be runnable inside Helenos. So, uh, so far, uh, we have uh, ported the GCC for uh, 6.3, Benutils uh, to 25.11, and Python. This Python port was contributed also by someone who is external to our team and uh, was later incorporated into the coastline uh, environment. Um, I don't know if it's visible, but we also have something uh, which can be used for um, periodic monitoring of the healthiness of, of these uh, ships, of these ports. Uh, for each architecture that we support, or almost for each of, the, each of them, um, there is a test of, uh, of all of these ships, whether it builds fine, whether, it, whether the build of them just runs to completion and produces no error. Um, so now we come to the point when uh, I will talk about the out of three branches <coughs> stuff that was not yet merged. So there is uh, there is now an effort to um, refactor the USB stack that we have um, to give it a better structure uh, with respect to the multi-server architecture and also uh, to support USB um, to the zero and also uh, possibly some other missing features such as isochronous transfers. Uh, this is almost complete and I hope it will be integrated really soon. There's still something mi missing, but uh, a week before FOSDEM I noticed uh, there was an update from, from Jano who is working on it, that uh, he was already able to, um, to use some high-speed device, some tablet uh, which is supported by QEMU. So I'm quite excited about it. Um, 
Another set of interesting changes are actually uh, the following four ones. Uh, so uh, VFS2, something that in general can be described as VFS2 or a second generation virtual file system. Uh, because right now there is a virtual file system server in Helenos written in C, which is I think quite a traditional. Uh, it uh, provides a single global namespace for uh, for the files, and uh, to the applications, uh, the file system looks like a classic Unix file system. But uh, there were some interesting ideas related uh, to to this effort. There is also a bachelor thesis uh, related to this project. Uh, do we have Yuri here, by the way? Who is he is the author of it. No, he's not here. Anyway. So the motivation behind VFS2 uh, was actually a security concern. Um, the idea was that the user cannot be sure with the loyalty of the applications that he is executing. Um, let's say, um, imagine yourself as a completely inexperienced uh, computer user and you download an application from the internet and then you run it. So uh, you hope that the application will be loyal to you, but it's often not the case. Uh, sometimes the applications are harmful and can access your data, can delete your files, your, your photographies, your databases. So uh, this is the motivation behind the FS2. The, uh, um, motto behind this was the, uh, to have an inversion of, uh, if you've heard this, what you see is what you get, acronym uh, used in um, text editing. So if you have an inversion, what you don't see is what you don't get. So if you change the VFS layer so that uh, you don't have no longer a global namespace, you have uh, pair process namespaces and uh, you, uh, you just uh, make all the naming uh, a local thing so that uh, if you have two processes and uh, you have two file names in both of them that are the same, for instance, uh, slash home slash uh, foo, uh, they don't necessarily uh, have to be the same thing. Uh, they are relative relative to, to their namespace. So, Names in VFS2 became ambiguous, and the idea was uh, actually uh, to be able to give each process its own namespace, so that when you have an application, you can limit uh, limit the, the the amount of things that it can see in the file system to only the absolute minimum, to restrict its access to only the very minimum of things that it needs to work properly. Yeah, um, this uh, VFS2 uh, implementation was written in the Go language, which is interesting from the point of Helenos because so far everything uh, was implemented in, uh, in C. Um, also, um, this, this is one of the things which prevented it from being merged to Helenos because it's, it would be quite a change for us. So now uh, there is another branch, VFS to Cherry Pick, which is an attempt to bring some of the aspects of this uh, VF new VFS back to Helenos. And this VFS to Cherry Pick branch is written in C, so it's much easier uh, for integration. Um, I think enough uh, was said about this VFS to project. Now, um, the last uh, of uh, the out of two branches that I'm going to, man uh, to mention is actually the testing branch. Uh, again, this is uh, an effort to make the testing of Helenos easier, probably uh, automated. Uh, so, we have Martin, Martin left also. Um, uh, it's a result of master thesis of Martin Sucha, and uh, it's basically a framework which allows you to run tests in Helenos either directly from Helenos 
or uh, remotely. So you have a Python script which connects uh, to running instance of Helenos and spawns all the tests. It gives you some mm, uh, finer grained level of control over what tests should be run, how to capture uh, the results and report them back to the script. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, preparation for some automatic testing. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this being integrated into Helenos because now it happens that just people don't test new stuff or implement something new, don't test the old stuff. Things get broken. Yes, that's broken. Okay. And having uh, an automated testing uh, framework uh, will surely fix this. Uh, this is the list of uh, master and bachelor thesis uh, that were defended during the past year. Um, uh, the first one, read copy update, uh, written by Adam Hraška, whom, I'm, whom I also met yesterday at FOSDEN, so if you're lucky you can run into him. Uh, he wrote a thesis about uh, a very sophisticated synchronization algorithm read copy update, and Martin Ditsky will have a talk about about it later today, so I'm not going to mention it. Uh, there is uh, this IPv6 master thesis uh, by Anton Steinhauser. It's basically the description of the current IPv6 uh, thesis describing uh, the already mentioned testing framework, uh, a thesis describing the sound, uh, sound server architecture, and uh, also description of our graphical stack or the graphical user interface. So these are basically all uh, theses that are somehow related. Mainline or is in one of these uh, yet to be integrated branches. Uh, one interesting uh, thesis is Helenos Installer, even though not yet merged into, into Helenos, it's uh, it's important because uh, it uh, uh, okay, it, uh, it itself, which was not previously possible. So if you open up the thesis, you will find a one-page description uh, how what commands to run if you want to install Helenos from inside. And of course, this thesis was also related to implementing some implementing some uh, applications like formatic uh, partitioning of the hard disk. Okay. Um, so now uh, experience with the Summer of Code in Space 2013. It's a program which is inspired by the Google Summer of Code. Uh, in this case it's being uh, run and sponsored by the uh, European Space Agency and the focus is on uh, stuff which is somehow related to space exploration or space in general. In our case the link was the Leon 3 CPU because these CPUs are used uh, for embedded devices that are radiation hardened. And uh, uh, one note that I would like to make about this program is that it should, pr it should probably be called uh, winter of code in space because uh, these guys are extremely bad uh, in meeting deadlines. The program was supposed to start at August, or uh, was it August? I think August, but it start in October. So it ran un uh, until the end of the year. It was delayed uh, extremely. Uh, but uh, besides of that, I was quite satisfied with the students that we had this year. Um, the communication was very good. Uh, we used uh, the IRC channel a lot and um, it was also interesting from the, the technical point of view as I was trying to show you on the example of the differences between the Spark V8 and V9 architectures. He delivered all his goals and we have already integrated his, his branch into our main line. Okay, uh, to conclude my talk, um, here are four pictures from our Helenos camp that we have every year. So you can see uh, us programming, programming, eating, and uh, doing some uh, sightseeing uh, 
in southern Bohemia. So uh, if you like Helenos, uh, contribute something and uh, we, can, uh, we can go to a camp together next year. Uh, if you have any questions, if you're interested in some of uh, the theses that I uh, mentioned today, just feel free to go to helenos.org and there you will find um, all those theses and also our source code. And thanks for your attention. <laughs>